So we will get to our keynote panel discussion right away. Uh, so let us welcome, I'll make the introduction and then I will welcome all of our panelists to join us on stage. Uh, Dr. Hossein Zilur Rahman, economist and social thinker, um, um, he is a leading policy voice of Bangladesh with over three decades of experience within and outside the government. In 1996, uh, he founded the think tank Power and Participation Research Center, known as PPRC, and has been its executive chairman since 2000. Since 2019, he also took over the role of non-executive chairperson for BRAC. He authored and edited many influential publications on poverty, social protection, governance, urbanization, inclusive growth, social development, and sustainable health care. Dr. Rahman was appointed as an advisor to the former caretaker government of Bangladesh in 2009, 2008, and put in charge of the ministries of commerce and education. So when Dr. Rahman speaks, policymakers listen. Uh, we also have Hilary Miller Wise. I, is she here, Hillary? Don't see her yet. So Hillary uh, Miller Wise is the deputy director of for Global Growth and Opportunity and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She leads a team that focuses on the development, distribution, and use of financial services for the unbanked, especially women. Hillary has spent most of her career at the inter intersection of financial services, agriculture, and technology in emerging markets. Before joining. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2021, Hillary built the on-demand delivery business in Africa for the e-commerce company Bolt. She also served as CEO of two award-winning startups in agriculture technology and financial technology. Earlier, she led operations in Tanzania for TechnoServe and Africa operations for Grameen Foundation. She started her career in microfinance in Finca International, where she became the youngest director of one of the network's microfinance banks. We also have Sheila Patel. Sheila Patel is the founder director of the Society for Promotion of Area Resource Center, otherwise known as SPARC, an NGO based in Mumbai uh, that has been working tirelessly since 1984 to support community organizations of the urban poor in their efforts to access secure housing and basic amenities and seek their right to the city. Since 1919, she has also been secretary and chief executive of SPARC Samudaya Nirman Shahayak, SSNS, a non-profit company set up to assist slum communities take on construction projects in cities to provide slum dwellers to build homes and sanitations for themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Rahman, Hilary Miller-Wise, and Ms. Shila Patel. Thank you. Hilary, can you listen to us? Yeah? Yes, great. I can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for being up so late. Okay, so um, I'll start with Dr. Rahman. And we know him as Zilurbhai, so I'll refer to him as Zilurbhai, if that's all right. So, Zilurbhai, you have keenly observed the pandemic response, researched on its impact and effects on local and macroeconomic uh, level. So, how do you think Bangladesh and other growing economies in the region handled the response? Has the response led to greater divide or inequality in the economy? And just uh, maybe I give an idea on the learning first. Thank you. And uh, congratulations to BRAC for continuing this very important forum. Uh, I think when we're talking of the new normal, post-pandemic new normal, uh, we should be aware that there are four parts to it. One is the post-pandemic new normal. That is how pandemic has really transformed the realities. Second is the climate emergency. You mentioned it in your opening remarks too. That also is part of the new normal that we have to factor in. Third is the uh, global economic uncertainties, which are going to deepen as far as we can uh, estimate in the next, at least next few years. But the fourth part of the new normal is also important to underline, is that a part of the old normal is also part of the new normal, meaning that not everything has changed. New normal is not about a completely new script. Old battles have to be fought now also. They haven't gone away. So we have to keep that in mind, that the new normal has these four 
component parts that we need to take on board. How have we responded to this situation? In our part of the world, I would say, I, if I talk of Bangladesh, uh, one policy approach that uh, Bangladesh took, I, I won't talk about India because that's a different, was that somehow we prioritized the economy over everything else. There was a fear how that was going to, it was happening, which is why we were more, let's say, uh, conservative on shutdowns. It wasn't for long, it was for a few weeks at best. So economy was allowed to really move ahead. Uh, but, of course, uh, when I say that, economy was allowed to move ahead. Uh, when we talk of these words like economy, we also need to understand that there are multiple levels of these, and there are different types of actors who populate different parts of the economy. For example, the macroeconomy. Now, governments of here have been more attentive to the macro actors. And then there are actors at the microeconomy level, and of course, very critical at the mesoeconomy level. Those two levels haven't got the level of policy attention. Even though economy was prioritized, that those two levels didn't get sufficient attention. On health, I think we have done a good job of vaccination. There was initial sort of a confusion, but in a way, Bangladesh has, and in, if I look at its 50-year history, it has excelled in one area. If there is a defined mission in front of us, we seem to get our act together and solve it. Think of uh, uh, immunization. Think of getting children into school, early 90s onward. Vaccination was also a similar thing. There is a defined target, mission in front of us, we did solve it. And I think there was a lot of innovation. The Shuroka app was a great innovation by which people did manage to you know, register and all that we could track. But we haven't been particularly uh, successful in system-wide sort of uh, responses, which is why particularly the marginalized, the poor have really uh, have suffered. There was, I think, an interesting uh, and this is a larger policy issue which we have to factor in, is that we have always talked of expanding market, which is an important thing. Private healthcare was an important part of the whole scenario in Bangladesh. But in the COVID period, we saw a dramatic contraction of private health services. Dramatic contraction. And particularly urban women, et cetera, suffered. And that gives a new lesson. As we move forward, if we think of all the health system overall strengthening, we really need to take that on board uh, in terms of what sort of uh, policy levers we need to push. There was also, you indicated in your opening remarks, that one of the responses was digital push. Use that as a way to solve multiple areas. As I said, vaccination was one, the Shuroka app, the for example, the wage payments for government workers. So there was a push to deliver it via the mobile financial services. And it brought in a huge new number of people within that arena. These are important beginnings, but inclusion needs to lead to empowerment. And this is something that I want to emphasize. Financial inclusion needs to lead to financial empowerment. Inclusion automatically doesn't uh, indicate which way the balance of uh, benefits are going from the provider to the uh, beneficiary. We need to really, but digital push has really, was an important uh, push. In education, as you mentioned, there was an attempt to, uh, when school was shut down, to keep schooling alive through uh, digital uh, approaches. It exacerbated the uh, uh, inequalities, yes, but it also opened new windows. But there was not an ecosystem approach to it. Again, mission type of 
initiatives. We need to really, so the openings have been done, and now we need to really see how that, uh, uh, that response can be indicated. And unfortunately, as I said, the macroeconomic actors were, have been attended to. One important, I think for Brack also, this was an important, if I now move to learnings. One important learning that we need to think about is, you know, we can of course talk of which sector to work in, etc. But I went to Silet Villages when you, you know, this uh, new poor program that Brack initiated. One area where we need to really focus on is on process efficiency, not just new sectors, but even those sectors, process efficiency. For example, if I compare, government was very successful in delivering stimulus packages to macro actors, not so successful in delivering stimulus packages to SMEs, to agriculture, even to a social protection for the urban poor. But I saw that BRAC really uh, went out of its way. For example, from an application for a loan to a point in which the person receives the loan, that time was squeezed because of the urgency of the situation. And this process efficiency all across the delivery chain and in terms of the ecosystem is one of the learnings that we really have to take on board very strongly. Uh, new vulnerabilities have emerged. We need to address that. One is this concept that I actually introduced at that time was this new poor, meaning people who have been hit hard, they were not poor. This new poor needs to be addressed with different language, different tools, because they're not accustomed to getting support in the imageries of the poor. These are also important things, how people's aspirational personalities have changed. So we need to also be attentive to the, and BRAC, uh, I know the microfinance has been really uh, uh, creative in trying to address this. So that's one vulnerability we need to, and the urban, urban poor have been much more, hit much more hard and less, uh, more vulnerable. The, uh, one other area, SDG, you know, Abed Bhai mentioned SDG. And I, one of the vulnerabilities which I think we need to take on board is that certain SDGs have, are in danger of becoming off track due to the pandemic and other things. One of them is, one part of that eradication of poverty issue is nutrition. We were proceeding towards a more nutritional diet. We are now walking backward. How do we address that? It's an important issue that, because that has an impact on child health and everything else. The other area of uh, off-track SDG is secondary education. I, there is, you know, child marriage is one expression of that. But secondary education is the, like the black box, which will determine whether the youth that Abed was mentioning, they will be able to compete in not just one or two in millions, and also whether they will uh, drive those skill needs of the new economy. There is a dropout trend in that area. How do you reverse it? And here, one learning which is, one vulnerability and one learning which needs to be taken on board is that there has been a learning loss, despite the digital, etc. We haven't really figured out how to recover that learning loss. Government has tried to do it. For example, one of the clear learning is that learning loss cannot be recovered within the school calendar because you have already new challenges. Do you have another way to do it? And I feel very excited that in a way the pandemic has opened, a, for education in particular, has opened a fantastic new window, a pedagogic window of new way of delivering schooling. And I think the one of the things I found, for example, we are, you know, I'm sure in India to this Bangla, we call it Mukhastavidda, rote learning. But there was one innovation which was assignment. You know, uh, English medium school, etc., they know this very well. But the general schools were not aware of this. 
I had a ch chat with parents, guardians, and you know, students and teachers. And it was interesting that that really had a pedagogic hit in the minds of the student, in the mind of the parent, as well as of the teacher. Not the teacher so much, the other two. Those are new windows. How do you learning loss is one part, but as a whole, the pedagogic opportunity of really giving a new meaning to education is a wonderful new window that we really have to focus on. Uh, two other points and then I'll finish. One is that, you know, NGOs like BRAC, we deal with beneficiaries, right? Even government deals with beneficiaries. But, for example, you know, uh, microcredit is giving loan to, say, agriculturists or non-farm economies. Now, these people are getting that financial services all right. But for the particular economic activity they're doing, that particular mesoeconomy space needs some policy support. There's no one to really understand that particular need, articulate that need. So this mesoeconomy policy support, that's something new that we need to take on board. Because if you can give both the financial service, but also a better market development policy support, then it's a double win for the beneficiary. That other window has not been in focus. We need to really take that on board. So uh, uh, I'll say that we have a really fairly challenging new situation in front of us. Uh, and it, innovation is a key issue here. Collaboration you mentioned, but we also need to, one of that collaboration, certainly solutions on the ground have to be, we also need to really, uh, in a way, be that experiential learnings need to also fuel a better uh, messaging for the policy world from the uh, non-state actors. Because at the end of the day, we realize this is a connected thing. All of these multi -meta, meta transformations which are happening will require connected responses, which means that we have to talk not in different languages. We have to, and we cannot just be the receivers of wisdom from somewhere. We also have to be the givers of wisdom, not just experiential, but the wisdom also, which is why I'm happy to share uh, as a last uh, conclusion is that BRAC is taking initiative to convene at a global level, a Global South Knowledge Conference as one new window where we want this opportunity, use our capacity to talk in a different language, to articulate the new needs, both for action, but also for policy changes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rubai. That was, that was, that laid out the landscape very clearly. And, and uh, speaking of interconnectedness, and I wanna come to Hillary now. Hillary, uh, BMGF has played such a huge role in, um, supporting and the delivery of the vaccines. And, uh, and BRAC has been a long-term partner, and uh, we are very thankful for our partnership. So, Hilary, how do you think, I mean, uh, the different elements of particularly the financial inclusion uh, evolved during the pandemic? And, and again, some of the lessons that we can take away, and also maybe share a bit of our highlights looking ahead uh, with all these emerging challenges, what would be BMGF's priority going forward. Over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm so sorry I can't be there. Um, uh, the Bangladeshi hospitality is legendary, <laughs> which makes me especially uh, sorry that I can't be with you in person. Um, so to your first 
question. I'll, I'll start with the good news and then a bit of the bad news and then talk a little bit about where our strategy is going. Um, so I think some of the good news, which, which many of you are aware of or experience daily, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and put a finer point on it, is the effect that COVID has had on um, access to basic transaction accounts. I mean, I think the recent Findex uh, report really highlighted the fact that COVID has accelerated access. We know that in developing countries today, 71% of people have an account, which is up from 42% a decade ago. Um, that's fantastic traction. What it means is that two thirds of adults globally now make or receive a digital payment, um, which is very exciting and something that the foundation and others have been working very intensely on. Um, what's exciting about the last few years, and obviously, you know, the, the pandemic has been very hard for many, many reasons, but one of the benefits is that in developing countries, if we take out China, where digital payments um, were already pretty widespread, 40% of people made a digital payment for the first time during the pandemic. Um, so that this promise of uh, COVID accelerating uh, digital has really proven out in the data um, that we're seeing. And it, that promise is actually in that, that reality is uh, actually quite widespread in the sense that the gains are, are more evenly distributed um, across uh, different countries than, than ever before. Um, what we also know from that report is that the gender gap has been reduced. Um, those of you who've seen the report, the gender gap has reduced from 9% uh, to 6 percentage points, which is fantastic. Uh, in the in the FINDEX reports between uh, 2011 and 2017, um, we can see that there was slower growth than than I think many of us had hoped, and and COVID has really contributed to shrinking that gap. So now we find that 74 percent of men and 68 percent of women um, have an account in developing markets. All of that is great great news and something for us collectively as an industry to celebrate. So let me turn now to not so much the bad news, but the, the challenges and, and I think, you know, why we're all here and, and still engaged and, and trying to solve for these problems. Um, as we know, although the gender gap has decreased, it's still quite wide in a lot of markets. And if we take the market that, of course, you all are in in Bangladesh, um, we're still at a nine percentage point difference, a 19 percentage point difference. That's that's really sizable. Um, Pakistan is at a 15 uh, point difference. Um, that's obviously too wide for all of us and, and something that we need to double down on in the coming years. Um, Part of what's contributing to that, as we know, is, the, is access to mobile technology. If you look in the South Asia, South Asia region, women are 22 percentage points less likely than men to have a mobile phone. And of course, having a mobile phone, if we're talking about access to digital financial services, is absolutely vital, right? Um, it's central to be, being able to own a digital account. Um, in addition, what I would call out is that despite the continued growth in account ownership, only about half of adults in developing economies report that they could reliably access extra funds um, within 30 days. That, that signals a real vulnerability that um, the payments accounts and the basic transaction accounts we know from the evidence uh, that we have does contribute to helping people to bridge some of those gaps and to deal with shocks, but is often not sufficient. Um, what we also know is that dormancy rates continue to be very high in some markets. So in markets like India, where something like 98% of the population has 
an account, we still have somewhere around the high 40s, 48 percent uh, dormancy rates. Clearly, there's something that we're not solving for, whether it's the value proposition of the account, whether it's how uh, the distribution networks work. There are a number of different challenges there that we need to solve for to ensure that those accounts are actually bringing value to those customers and those customers feel that they want to use those accounts for different purposes. Um, what I would also call out that came out in the FINDEX report is about two thirds of the adults uh, in the markets that were surveyed worry about at least one area of financial stress. That could be things like paying a medical bill. Um, it could be paying for school fees. It could be just regular monthly bills or having enough money for old age. So clearly we, there's more work that we need to do to solve for the financial needs of low income people um, in the markets in which we work. Um, related to that is that access to other financial services lags significantly in many markets and especially for women. So again, if I turn to India, women owned, and this, this data is a little bit outdated, it's from IFC from I think 2016, but women owned micro enterprises in India face about a 71% gap in financing and 90% of women entrepreneurs in the country rely on informal sources of financing. Um, it will be very difficult to build economies and to help people get out of poverty if the financial sectors are not deepened and are not working um, for the poor. And so while there's a lot of reason to be excited as a result of the acceleration that, that COVID created in terms of access to financial services, there's still plenty of work for us to do um, to deepen these markets and truly make them work for low income customers. Thank you. Thank you. And, and this is so important. I mean, whether you're looking at um, humanitarian context, displacement, uh, or long-term development, I think financial inclusion and, as Zulubai said, financial empowerment, not just inclusion, is, is very, very crucial. Hillary, before I come to Sheilaji, maybe uh, in a one or two minutes, if you can highlight some key priorities going forward for BMGF going, um, beyond financial inclusion as well. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and hopefully many of you in the room will be part of this journey with us. Um, many of you know that the foundation and the financial services team has focused uh, quite intensively for the last five or six years on getting access to basic transaction accounts, um, to payment accounts. And clearly we've seen quite a bit of success there, which is, is fantastic. Um, where we're now turning is to continue to drive access to those accounts. So how can we continue to drive uh, G2P payments, um, continue to drive access to payments accounts, um, start to turn to areas like merchant payments, um, which, you know, Many people have worked on and, and there have been some challenges around really driving that, especially outside of urban markets and rural markets. Um, but now we're also turning our attention in addition to driving access to payments accounts to uh, what we're referring to as products beyond payments. And so uh, when we think about things like access to credit, what are those use cases or what are those products where there is strong evidence that if low income, low income customers can get access to those products, they can drive value either in the form of increasing income, smoothing consumption or improving resilience and for which those products actually can drive sustainability for the financial institution, right? So we, we recognize we need to balance supply and demand there. At the same time, there are a whole set of products and services where the evidence base, um, particularly on the credit side, is quite weak. We just don't know whether certain products and services actually can drive impact and can be sustainable for financial service providers. Um, where we have uh, decided to focus in that category 
is on uh, products like risk-based lending for microenterprise, particularly women-owned microenterprise. The region of the world that I know best is Africa, and in most of Africa, um, we don't really have risk-based lending. Most lenders don't do that because they don't have the data. And so how could we unlock data in a way that can drive um, cash flow based lending, um, products like uh, essentially um, uh, uh, recurring accounts uh, where uh, women owned micro enterprises can actually draw down on, on the credit uh, facility that they have available to them. Very difficult to do without data that allows you to properly uh, assess the risk of the customer. Um, the, the last two areas that I will highlight, um, the first is on different tools and services that allow people to manage risk better. So microinsurance is one, uh, and different types of microinsurance to deal with risks like health shocks, which we know is one of the major drivers that causes people to fall back into poverty, um, as well as savings instruments. And then the last is really focusing on um, driving, uh, focusing on closing the gap on uh, the gender gap on financial inclusion. So in markets like Bangladesh and like Pakistan, where we still have pretty significant gaps, what do we need to do in order to develop the products the distribution channels, um, the education that's needed in order to close the gender gap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad to hear that microinsurance is part of them because it, the resilience building and making people shockproof is going to be a key, key sort of development goal going forward as we are facing climate change. So, the, which brings me to Sheila, Sheila Ji. Shilaji, I mean, you have been such a tireless advocate for urban poor over the years and, and have now sort of are playing a very crucial role in terms of adaptation going forward. How does this movement of population look like in the next decade as a, as a result of climate change and how can we prepare? Maybe, maybe give us the Global South perspective. First of all, I... So first of all, thank you for inviting me. I love the, the title of frugality. Uh, I live in that space in my work. And I'm just, I'm very, very happy to listen to what you have to say because you represent the other end of the spectrum. So what I thought I'd do is uh, focus on three things. One is, uh, looking at COVID and the urban poor in India, which I know most about. Then about the work that I do on the urban poor internationally and my most recent exploration of the adaptation space. So I think in India, as in South Asia, as you mentioned, the minute there is a crisis, there's confusion for the first few months and then the bureaucracy, the institutions, the communities, everybody gets their act together somehow. And we survive at an amazing cost, but we still survive. And I think that's the South Asian way. Uh, what we found is that uh, the extent of the dependency of the elite on the urban poor was really discovered during this period because the only thing that worked were all of us as elite calling on the phone to get services. That meant poor youth especially uh, delivered you the services. That's what happened in most of the urban areas in India. There was an interesting lessening of the gap between rural producers of food and services to the cities. But the most amazing and newfound data was that we have 200 million people who are circular migrants, who we saw walking home in the first three months because they couldn't earn money in the city, they couldn't refill their phone, 
They couldn't pay their rent in the informal settlements where they rented a bed because their uh, landlords were also very poor and needed money. So for the first time, people who work on demographies, on statistics and population, actually began to see the differentiation between migrant families who had come to live in the city versus the circular migrants who came into the city and put money back. So one of the things I've been asking all the policymakers to do is, you know that India has this huge rural program called the Narega, uh, which provides 100 days base support for people who don't have incomes. The, the little bit of data that we got from NGOs who were look, listening to people who came back to the village on examining their chief minister's discussion about saying that we will keep these people back here, we will increase the Narega thing. And the people said, no, we want to go back because we get four times the salary in the city than you get here. And we are no longer equipped to do rural livelihood projects. We are now urban skilled workers. So it was a very interesting uh, newfound insight into that. But more than that, what it made many of us do is to ask these economists and to ask people who do macro data to examine whether, like the World Bank data on diaspora to India and to Bangladesh, often exceeding the foreign direct investment, whether urban uh, remittances to rural households exceeds this amount, because I think it does. So I think this was the interesting side things that we saw. Uh, since I work with poor communities and networks, I think the most important difference between the urban poor's ability to withstand this crisis were whether they were organized, they had collective power or not. Wherever they did, they were able to negotiate better, they were able to distribute more equitably whatever resources came to them, and they were able to withstand the challenges better. So the issue of sustained mobilization and organizational investments in very poor communities, for me, has gotten heightened more than ever before because they are under the radar for everybody. Of course, now in India, we have the Aadhaar card. We have this amazing vaccination data that is uh, just uh, unbelievably efficient. But what we also understood is that within households, you know, we talked about digital things. The man had a third or a second-hand smartphone, and the woman had the old phone. And when you have three children who have to do digital education, there was a war inside the house, because you can only do it with a smartphone. The digital education wasn't designed for the old phones. So when we, you know, when this distinguish, you know, distinction is not made between the new technology and the old, uh, it loses a lot of the uh, detailed things. If we come back to the issue you talked about is uh, looking at post-COVID world. The first six to eight months, every webinar I attended said, build back better. And then you talked about the old normal. I think we are on the old normal as far as build back better has happened, because I don't see any movement towards the build back better. It's actually gotten worse. Uh, the Ukraine war, which is, I think, the fourth thing which you should have talked about, has dislocated us in an amazing number of ways, apart from the global uncertainty of where it will go. But what it has done is it has reduced the amount of global assistance to national and local development projects. The and then the, diff you, know, the, you know, the UN itself separating the SDGs and the climate compact has also produced a challenge of whether you are in the development bucket or you're in the climate bucket. In reality, in the lives of poor people, as a new entrant to climate change discussions, I just feel that we have to look at all development with a scientific climate lens. Otherwise, we will be doing maladaptation. 
But I think that uh, development institutions, global ins agencies that develop these policies are still having these two buckets. So climate does come in one of the bits of SDGs. But today, at least in the last two years with the IPCC report, it's very clear that the uncertainties that in a way symbolized by COVID is that we don't actually know what we are going to anticipate in the extreme weather changes that are going to happen. And I don't know whether we can have the kind of a time frame to deal with emergencies that even got, got in COVID. I don't think we have that for climate, and I don't think we are equipped for it. If you take the issues of urban poverty, uh, you know that the Oxfam report continues to hold ground that 15% of the world's population owns 75% of its wealth, and that is reflected right down to our countries and our cities. So with that inequity in place, everything that we speak about becomes slightly hazy and soft because it doesn't address this inequitable equation, which is worsened by COVID, I think, because that prediction was pre-COVID. Many governments don't like that. Governments are very hostile to such things because uh, they see privatization as a very important way forward in generating wealth. But in the cities, the, the, the transformation of the city space and the urbanization of poverty is an issue which is very much an issue of the future because some people are predicting that already there are 2 billion people living in terrible conditions in the cities but that another billion and a half will come in the next three years due to, as climate refugees. And we are not equipped for it at all. We, are not, we don't know what to do. So when I look at the things that we do, it's a dip, small dip in the ocean, but I think in the right direction. And the first thing is to create large movements and networks of poor people so that they achieve empowerment to make their noise and hear, get their voices heard. I like that point you were talking about empowerment, that delivery beneficiary status has to be transformed into empowerment. So how do we create conditions by which large numbers of people are able to aggregate their demands and participate centrally in the solution design rather than just be beneficiaries? This is a tall ask because Development investment is getting more and more projectized, more and more small NGOs, unlike you, become contractors of delivery of top-down processes. And it's only people like us who challenge the structure of development investments and sustain the frugality of our empowerment process, which is sometimes counterintuitive. Uh, is how I think we will keep that flag going because more and more projects make people beneficiaries. The assessment is on the basis of physical delivery of goods and services, but not the transformation of those people and their aspirations. Because we're talking, Abed Bhai always talked about aspirations and transformations uh, in the few times that I met him. So I feel that this conversation here has to address those issues that how do we as a, a, a quite a small community of development activists uh, work harder to produce social movements of people who are voiceless and transform the development interventions so that they have a say in what is happening. Not only at the local level, because that we have achieved, but at other levels. And uh, in the work that I do as Slum Dwellers International, in which we work with 32 countries and, uh, and the urban poor in about 200 cities, the whole purpose is to say, how do we articulate what we need? How do we learn about the challenges 
that we are not aware of and that we have to address? And how do we become part of the solution process and not stay as consumers and beneficiaries of the solution? And that will come out of a persistent and ongoing attempt to build these movements rather than just become delivery agents of change. And now, all over the world, this whole issue of the impact of colonized research practices, racism, all these things are beginning to come out. Somehow COVID has done that in a, in a strange way. So how do we bring all those discussions into our conversations with donors, with governments, with institutions that have done very well in service delivery, but now want to transform it into something that makes people agents of change themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shivaji. Beautiful. I mean, I think, I guess this is the same thing you're going to articulate in COP this year as yes. well. COP is coming, coming around. Um, and I want to conclude this panel with something, I think, uh, a bit more uplifting because I know these challenges are very daunting, essentially. I mean, we are, but at the same time, we need to have something that excites us every morning. So maybe starting with Shilaji, what excites you in short, in one minute, every get to get up every morning? I am absolutely energized with how positive women are about wanting to make change happen. So that keeps me awake, that keeps me energized, and that's what kept me running for the several decades that I'm doing this. But it is amazing that despite being so disenfranchised, being neglected, their nurturance, their capacity to explore, their power of collective behavior is transformative. We have to still tap it. Hillary, thank you, amazing. Hillary, what excites yeah, you? So, so perhaps building on that, I'm, I'm so energized and excited every day about the innovation that I see in the markets that we work in and innovation that's driven by the global south for the global south. Um, there are so many uh, entrepreneurs, uh, startups who are um, struggling every day to solve for these challenges. And the, the ingenuity that they have to solve for these problems is so inspiring. Uh, and so I get really motivated by that every day. Thank you. Silly uh, I'm really excited by, you know, we were doing things in a certain way. These multiple things, the pandemic, the climate emergency, and the Ukraine war led uh, or induced global uncertainty, all, all really have shaken us up. So I think that's uh, shaken us up and we are also trying to see the opportunities. And I want to particularly emphasize one of the key learnings for this wake up, new waking up, is that we must have cross boundary, cross uh, boundary conversations, solution like learning loss. Will it be just the problem of the educators, or is it also a problem of community organizers? Housing solutions, is it will just the problem of the architects, or is it also of how we think about urban spaces. This cross-boundary conversations is absolutely, it keeps me great excited. And I also, you know, in this theme of empowerment, uh, I think another wake-up call which is, has come, must come. If it doesn't come sufficiently, it must come, following on your intervention too, is this uh, certain imagery has got really set beneficiaries, these words. And behind these words, there is a whole sort of thought process. That thought process has to be broken up, challenged, opened up. And not just in terms of uh, uh, just academic debates, but from actual experiential learnings, we have to really also reclaim, so to say, I would say, 
reclaim the knowledge and policy space also as we find the solutions on many issues. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, there are challenges. There are so many uh, opportunities looking at it, not just from the lens of problems, but uh, problem, uh, opportunities from the courage on the frontliners and, and women and, and everywhere. I think the innovations are everywhere, so we just have to look for it. Thank you. Let us give us a big round of applause to the panelists for their, I think, nice setting the agenda. Thank you.